thank you very much and welcome everyone to the um to the second the second panel of the day um I'm really, I'm really excited because we have um, a, an amazing lineup um, for this for this live session. Um, thank you, thank you all the to all the the attendees, and also thank you, a special thanks to the to the participants we have today in, in this panel. Uh, well, my name is Alberto Marti, and the VP of Open Source Community Relations at Open Nebula. And um, yes, yeah, I said I'm really happy to be to be here with uh, with uh, colleagues from um, three of the major systems integrators in, in Europe. I'm going to uh, I mean, I'm personally going to enjoy this this session a lot, and I'm sure you you enjoy the uh, the insight we're going to get from from this uh, these three experts we have today. So, Jean Philippe, welcome to the welcome to the panel. Thank you, Alberto, for uh, for uh, having me for the opportunity. Thank you for having uh, us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you very much. Miguel Angel, welcome. And um, Klaus, welcome to the panel okay. as well. Thank you all for, for making it today to, to, to this session. Um, well, uh, I think um, you all agree, and I'm sure the, the audience will agree that, the, um, especially in Europe, we are, we're living at a, a really exciting times. We um, we, we are feeling or starting to feel firsthand what the this promised change in the in the market uh, uh, is going to is, is going to be about this uh, this promise of, of edge computing. But um, the idea for the for the panel today is for companies like yours who are actually in contact with uh, some of the great um, um, industry actors in in the continent, but also with uh, with uh, governments of, um, and, and institutions across the continent. How you see the actual um, expansion of, of, of edge computing in, in Europe specifically, um, and how you see the future of this of this technology and the, the changes it's bringing to the to the cloud market? So, what just uh, just a uh, launch a question there for you? So, um, we've we've all seen the 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 market analysis, these very optimistic predictions for for a number of years, but what edge computing is going to be like uh, this disruption is going to bring to the, to the cloud market from your perspective your, your, your respective perspectives um how do you actually perceive that demand have you actually seen that a clear demand from your from your customers uh, your, your, your large customers for instance about the what edge computing is bringing to to them i know uh Jan Philippe, do you want to just have sure thanks um so there's no doubt that there's clear demand. Um, but I think uh, one key aspect is to look at uh, what we call edge computing, you know, because uh, if you look at market forecast and you consider that, uh, you know, for instance, an IoT gateway is edge computing uh, and an IoT gateway is not a new solution. So um, there are some market study that shows, you know, that actually edge computing is already a huge market compared to cloud. And that's because there is these, uh, all these distributed uh, technologies, especially related to IoT, um, as well as the initial work that is done by telecom provider, you know, with uh, the move towards a more distributed uh, telecom architecture. So there's definitely a, a clear demand for those uh, particular uh, deployment. Um, then I would say there are more experimental uh, use cases and a lot of trials for other uh, use cases uh, across industries, you know, whether it's uh, uh, gaming, uh, smart cities, um, connected vehicles, supply chains. Um, but I would say that uh, in those industries, it's a, it's a bit more uh, nascent uh, because it's really, you know, disrupting uh, the business of uh, those organizations. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. From the demand point of view, I think that um, the situation is uh, different uh, case by case. So, yeah, several sectors where we see that the clear demand at the moment, um, always uh, maybe will take some time. So, for example, in the manufacturing sector, in industries, uh, heavy industries, uh, we see a clear, a clear demand because of the of the evolution of the operational technologies that are migrating to more the IT uh, platforms and technologies. So there is a clear movement from this uh, close 
uh, platforms to more open uh, approaches. And, and, and I think that uh, the DH is, is playing a role clearly on those uh, manufacturing companies. I also maybe the most uh, mature is the energy sector, the distribution of uh, electricity, for example. But I think that is uh, absolutely in, in, a, in, a, in a ramp up situation. Uh, there is um, a clear movement on, for example, in the distribution of the transformation, the superstation, uh, all the in the in the electricity network, that they are in also migrating from a specific equipment to a more uh, a virtualized uh, ecosystem that is also running on, on the edge. So there is a huge demand coming from the big uh, utilities in our case in uh, electricity, especially. And another sector is, is, is with a specific, but also very demanding, and we're also playing there is in the defense that uh, we see also clear, clear demand, maybe in a different uh, scenario. But those three sectors, I think they are really tracking the market. Yeah, I can only agree, um, as uh, Jean Philippe and also Miguel said. Uh, in fact, edge computing is something that we are dealing with for quite some long time. Uh, but what, what's now happening is devices get smarter and smarter and devices produce more data. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is um, you also have edge computing capabilities and uh, always like to keep everybody in mind that there's uh, on-premises edges, mobile edges, edge data centers. So it's a wide variety of things. Uh, but all these capabilities actually have more and more processing capabilities. Uh, we, for instance, also produce hardware and we have um, artificial intelligence in these edge devices. We have video recognition, all yep. kinds of things. So this is um, together with more data from the smart devices. You have additional capacity on the edge, uh, whether it's mobile, uh, on-premise or what have you. And on top of that, um, you uh, have more and more connectivity options. Uh, we have mobile edges. We are working very, very strongly on IT, OT conversions. So get the connectivity between what is happening between isolated networks and edges in isolated networks to processing of tons of data on an, on an hyperscaler. So um, as Jean-Philippe, as Miguel said, um, Edge very, very clearly has already gotten, gotten a lot of additional traction and uh, we definitely see um, this continuing to grow specifically with all the projects that are starting now uh, to also provide additional foundation services to allow better resilient latency controlled distribution of workloads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good, good to hear that. Yeah, because um, I mean, um, one of the one of the challenges we, we we've seen over the last couple of years, well, more than that, is actually the um, a challenge more, more common in some in some sectors than others. Obviously, to to explain, I mean, to can disseminate this concept of, of edge computing. So to be able to clearly state and, 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 and help people picture the benefits it's going to bring to, the, uh, to, their, to their businesses and sometimes to help companies change the, their, their business models using, using the new edge computing approach. So, you know, if you, if you in, in your experience, you've had to, you have, um, you have been dealing with this challenge as well. I mean, how you deal with this this challenge of having to explain to to people and companies what edge computing is, T taking into account the, I mean the many different definitions that sometimes we 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 encounter in the <laughs> in, in in out there, right? So how do you how do you see this uh, this proliferation of, of 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 the concept of the edge? What the edge means for for different sectors? If you want, I can start, um, and I would actually contradict a little bit the statement that it's difficult to explain the benefit from edge computing. Uh, what is a little bit the challenge is uh, uh, to see how to make edge computing really work. And, and I mean this in the sense of not isolated on the edge, but um, taking a use case that goes from the edge all the way to across the different uh, uh, providers. So, so connecting the edge across different providers. Uh, today is 
something that many of the companies here around the table has re have resolved. Uh, but um, it's always I always call these hand stretched solutions. Uh, it's nothing that easily and automatically comes because we all agreed on the same framework or we have all the same plugs that we're using uh, to connect various devices. Uh, it's easy to see. Um, I mean, we know examples in the industry that um, uh, also Gaia X companies are working with, um, where you're connecting complete supply chains uh, from the edge on the shop floor uh, across the different providers. And the benefit is very, very clear to everybody. Uh, what I think the, the challenge is, Alberto, is rather, well, how do we make it, how do I make it work if company A is using provider uh, nine, company B is provide, using another provider, company C is using another provider, and eventually different uh, technologies. And this is where I see the industries and in the partnership uh, across the companies that are also around this table, will have to drive the easy adoption of edge computing forward, because I think honestly, the benefits are clear if it's easy to consume. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I absolutely agree with Klaus. Uh, I see some other challenges, uh, for example, when we deal with um, utility uh, companies, as I mentioned before, that they need to substitute a huge amount of, of, of legacy equipment. So the business case sometimes uh, is, is difficult. So how, how to found this, uh, um, some, sometimes uh, I think that the qualitative is clear, but most of this uh, business uh, case um, development is, is, is a challenge now for the CFO, how to make it happen uh, from the financial point of view, how we got it in place a uh, huge amount of, of capital. So this is a challenge um, from my opinion. And also I see from the operational point of view as uh, edge, brings new technology, sometimes the OT uh, teams are trained on a skill on some technologies and this, uh, the DS brings new ones. And sometimes you don't have these, uh, these capabilities in your own uh, people. And, and also sometimes it's also not, not so easy to get the right people from, from the suppliers. So there is also some pain of, uh, develop, uh, of deploying this is because they think that okay, it's uh, in terms of business continuity, it's uh, still uh, some 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 then a bit of threat of of taking the the step. And to build on uh, what Miguel mentioned, I think uh, definitely uh, the IT OT convergence that we see with edge computing uh, is is a challenge in terms of, you know, um, having the right people on the table and ensuring that uh, we all understand each other. Uh, because um, like Klaus mentioned, uh, I mean, we can speak about specific solution in edge computing, but actually any business use case will require uh, multiple technological solution and potentially an ecosystem yeah. uh, of providers. You know, that's part of what we do with system integration. That's integrating that uh, that ecosystem, uh, and so yeah, it's a complex ecosystem of people with different backgrounds, uh, different skills, and uh, ensuring that we we can all articulate what are the constraints and the benefit on the on the business side, um, and also explain in simple terms, you know, the very powerful technologies that that we have now. Um, so I I do think that that convergence uh, provides a I would say a communication challenge, both on the uh, enterprise side and in our side. Well, you, you've you've all mentioned uh, providers, which is a, it's a very interesting topic. Now, yeah, that you mentioned providers, um, um, I would like to know your perspective. Um, I mean, we have our perspective from the from the from the infrastructure level um, at the challenges of, of um, the, for instance, federating. Um, cloud providers and, and things like that. But then uh, edge computing, as it's being uh, defined, at least from a European perspective, it comes with that challenge as well. So the, the being able to bring something that's easy to use um, 
that can actually manage these at a scale, the, a large, potentially large or very large number of providers. Um, but then there's also the other side of the, uh, the, uh, the coin, let's say, and that's also the, the, the potential of edge computing in Europe to, to create, to help to create a new ecosystem of, of infrastructure providers. I know you've already, well, Miguel Angel, you've, you've mentioned the utility sector. I know, I don't believe you have also experience with, uh, with the telcos. I mean, there's a lot of expectations, right? But in terms of the um, being successful in, in, in accomplishing those objectives of the European Commission by 2030, having this 10,000 edge nodes. And how do you see the market? Is the market reacting already to this opportunity of new companies from different or non-traditional um, IT sectors um, becoming new new infrastructure providers with with edge resources they're deploying their own edge resources so um i, th I take this one um so of course you know i mentioned the telcos and uh, one thing to consider uh if we take europe uh, we could take, of course, over region, but let's take Europe. Uh, it's an immense geography. And uh, if we want to have some kind of service continuity across that geography, this would require, you know, many edge nodes for any kind of organization or for, I would say, more end user services like uh, a connected car, for instance. So then we have to think about sustainability. You know, if every organization is deploying their edge nodes all across Europe, we will end up with a lot of infrastructure. So um, I think then that, that there's an opportunity, of course, to, to deploy those edge nodes, which don't exist right now, that uh, telecom providers are, of course, in a prime position to do so. Um, but that indeed, um, other kind of organizations, whether it's uh, UTT providers um, or um, let's say a road infrastructure providers could, you know, enter uh, that uh, that that business. I would say, um, yet it's uh, it's a new capability, it's uh, new skills that they might not have. Um, so for now, um, I, I I personally don't see you know that kind of uh, actors really uh, providing uh, that capacity. I think at least to date. Um, it's uh, it's very much based or rely, I would say, on the uh, telco and existing uh, cloud providers uh, to provide uh, local capabilities. Yeah, there's uh, Jean-Philippe. There's some additions to it, uh, and uh, most of the audience will perhaps be familiar with uh, uh, what is called the international uh, important project of common European interest uh, for CIS Cloud Edge Continuum. Um, and uh, we as ATOS are working in Germany with a number of partners uh, who on the one hand side uh, will build, uh, actually concrete number is more than 500 uh, edge data centers along uh, a fiberglass network along the railway lines um, with, a, with a very, very specific purpose to bring um, cloud computing very, very close to, for instance, production sites uh, to uh, manage latency, um, uh, to bring it close to where you have moving, uh, um, like automobiles, like automotive driving. Uh, so distribution of these workloads uh, is something that has an uh, uh, own business case. Uh, so if it's 500 in Germany on this single provider only, then I believe we, we can come close to the target Alberto mentioned. Um, there's also a second um, um, a category of, of edge cloud providers, um, which is uh, companies who make a specific case to say, we build compute capacity close to where energy is being produced, like in wind farms and where you have easy cooling or where you can uh, dissipate heat directly into um, um, well, cloud and he heating systems, for instance, of cities or reuse uh, uh, process um, uh, heat from, from other sites. So um, you have the mobile edges that uh, Jean-Philippe mentioned, 
I think there's an emergence of edge computing capability that wants to go very, very close to latency sensitive environments. And you have this area where you uh, focus on energy efficiency and put uh, relatively small data center, edge data centers close to, uh, for instance, uh, uh, wind farms, for instance, other heat generating uh, sources. <laughs> yeah, so I think it's it will happen, Alberto, uh, from the use case perspective, yeah. and from a perspective just to be able to process all these huge amounts of data as soon as 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 close to the source as possible. Yeah. 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 Uh, to to say something else. Uh, yeah, I think that this is not no easy question, easy answer to to the question, and but I think that there. Are Two principles that uh, that will apply. One is that uh, it requires uh, collaboration, so there is no single company or single sector that can track the demand by by itself. It will require collaboration from from many. So, depending on the sector, depending on the business scenario and the use case, uh, will be different compositions. So, in some cases, the industrial uh, company will take the lead in a factory, for example, and bring capacities, not only for this facility, but for the surrounding, uh, for example, business or whatever. So maybe the case in some others will be the telco company, in some others, who knows, the city or whatever. So will be non-symmetric, will be different case by case. And in almost all the cases will require collaboration from, from different actors. So. It will be more, more difficult, maybe more inductive. No, it is not, will be done by design, will be more because the things will happen and, and then will the, the, no, will spread into the territory, but will be a bit irregular, this dissemination. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's a challenge in itself, right? So having all this, uh, this diversity. Um, yeah. How is it from your perspective? I mean, one of those actors that you in that kind of broad ecosystem that you mentioned and, and, and Klaus mentioned it as well before is, is hardware manufacturers or the hardware component, right, of these uh, in this formula. So uh, how do you see from, from your perspective experiences the, the engagement or the involvement of, 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 of hardware manufacturers in, in building these new resources for the edge, like um, carbon neutral or highly secure, all these expectations of that, that uh, put on on these these new resources um in in places like yeah like on board of a, of a, of a, of a train or, or in a place that uh, that's uh in a, in a remote location and stuff like that how do you see are they actually patients or well that's a very very specific question <laughs> um, yeah. as we as we're doing i try to i try to answer that a little bit um um um, in, 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 in a wide scale. Um, so on, on the one hand side, uh, we've been talking about multiple providers that have to build these uh, uh, continuums. And as uh, I think Miguel said, um, it, it, it does require a lot of cooperation. You're not going to have every provider putting uh, the same edge nodes in the same locations. They'll be completely stupid, redundant, uh, inefficient. Uh, and it's like... Um, the telco providers are sharing the, the, the mobile stations. Uh, you, we will see providers actually uh, co-locating, or I, I, I want to be a little bit more specific, working on virtual co-location uh, to make sure that you can use uh, hardware and hardware technologies like bare metal as a service to share facilities as much as possible. Uh, uh, another aspect, uh, and here we come to a uh, very, very specific um, uh, attribute of hardware is um, that we need to look at how we can optimize uh, energy consumption across such a network. Uh, if, uh, if, if in my example, you use um, um, hardware inside of wind farms, uh, you would want to put the compute in the location where the wind blows and not where you have to substitute energy by some other, other kind of resources. Huh? So the hardware needs to be supporting um, the distribution of workloads by parameters they give to, to, a, to a control plane to say what kind of energy I'm using, what kind of workload 
um, uh, is on my devices. Uh, and that in turn requires um, a pretty much aligned uh, technology stack uh, from the very, very bottom, including hardware security uh, to absolutely ensure that we, uh, that you cannot fake <laughs> identities of devices in between and that needs to go across the full stack uh, and of course you need to have um, software layers that supporting the meshing of resources across different uh, providers uh, so you were asking you were starting to ask with hardware and my response is it cannot only be resolved with hardware we, we really have to i don't know if it's a smart term but i say we we almost have to make hardware as a service, networking as a service, and have a new way of managing this control plane to, to really allow meshing of uh, applications based on operator requirements or based on application requirements, like latency to be very, very efficient in distributing workloads based on um, energy consumption and parameters like latency and resilience. And of course, hardware specific, I think um, we need to make sure that we work with the different providers, that the cooling and heating solutions of the hardware become uh, A, of course, terribly efficient, but B, also in a way that we can come to a, a inter-exchangeably of solutions um, to reach a, a sensible level of scale across providers. Yeah, uh, so I agree with you, Klaus. I think that uh, maybe the work here is interoperability. It's uh, absolutely required because we will need to be very seamless and we need we will decide how and where to compute based on, on different uh, variables like, like uh, energy consumption and, and some other things. So to do so, of course, we need to move computation from one place to another in a very transparent way. So, uh, probably it will make the, the difference will be the key. Yeah. And um, the you know that the hardware providers, of course, they are they are key um, because we are in a lot of use cases dis discussing offloading compute, you know, from devices to an edge node. So if you think about it, it means that we have at least you know for the business to be viable two, three, four, maybe a dozen, maybe a hundred of those devices uh, that are sending events to you know, one edge location. Um, and you want it to be energy efficient, but at the same time, you want it to be able to process all those events. And we're not just discussing you know, simple processing of uh, text messages, uh, but videos and executing uh, AI. So it definitely requires you know, engineering to ensure that there's the energy consumption that is optimized, but at the same way that we can support uh, all the different uh, use cases and at scale. Um, and collaboration with the hardware vendors is uh, even more important uh, as some of them are on both sides. They're on the device side, as well as on the um, edge infrastructure side. Um, and so thinking about, again, the whole solution um, will allow uh, to have a better energy efficiency and better performance uh, as a whole. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and then speaking of, um, of this... Um... this um, capability of um, moving workloads to one place to another but because obviously the, the 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 risk or the challenge with this with the proliferation of edge nodes and and with the proliferation specifically of, of edge providers is that is that i mean keeping that that connectivity and that, that connection between them and for users to be able to actually leverage the resources where they need them and not, not because they cannot interact with um, provider if they're using provider a they cannot interact with b c and d so um and and cloud you've mentioned before the the ipsi um that's one of the that's that's a, a major project we, we we copied the link on the on the chat for people to have a look at what's going on in, in this in this project there's a european uh, a european project supported by the commission um it's um, it's not only this project, right? I mean, you've mentioned uh, Gaia X as well. There is the new European Alliance for for Industrial uh, Data as in Cloud. 
So there are a number of, of pan-European projects looking at that a specific challenge of edge computing or that edge computing is, is bringing along, which is the, the, the federation and how you federate all these resources when they come not just from one or two providers, but they come from potentially thousands of, of, of local or smaller providers. How do you see in this, in this, in this, on those, all these projects that are looking at these challenges, how do you see your role as, as, as a major European integrators? How do you see your role in, 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 in facing this, this technological challenge as well? I was laughing because you mentioned the word integrators and uh, I would see the all very integrative. <laughs> um, because I, I think, as I mentioned before, I think individually uh, with two companies or for a single use case in, I don't know, energy or healthcare, uh, a lot of the problems have been resolved. Uh, but as soon as you have uh, two use cases coming together, you see we have interoperable technologies or network topologies or what have you. Uh, and um, the role of the European projects should be that we manage to get all the wonderful stuff that each of the companies around the table and likely in the audience um, that we have, that we work towards together um, making it something that uh, Miguel mentioned it, is, is becoming interoperable and can easily work uh, with each other. Uh, what we need to achieve is a level of scale that we can easily um, take data out of one edge, data out of one use case, make it available also across um, different sectors, networks, um, um, use cases, all maintaining the level of resilience, uh, addressing latency, addressing security, and addressing privacy um, without, without each and every time trying to um, overcome disruptions in the or disrupt uh, um, different technologies or different regulatory frameworks. Uh, so for me, the a European open source ecosystem needs to bring all these individual very, very, very good solutions, uh, bring them together and allow us to scale as a group of companies and as a group of different providers um, towards the very, very big increase in data and use cases. And just final word, I don't think this is just a European um, kind of question. I think we have the same requirement uh, across uh, well uh, uh, all of the countries all across the globe oh. yep yeah. yeah i see also yeah absolutely um i see the uh, our companies like uh, catalyst somehow so there is uh, many ingredients are over there but somebody needs to connect it and to, to make it happen and also to, to bring uh, viable business cases, uh, useful use cases onto the table um, because the deployment will be progressive as we mentioned before. So I think that we, our role is provoking the, the, these connections and bringing people together to, to bring as at the beginning as small things, but can scale up. Um, is there a different way of selling services and and because and also the commercial activity is different and also how we bring the value to our clients it's a different methodology for sure and a different role but I see as um, as absolutely require companies to, to organize all these uh, heterogeneous ecosystem to put concrete and real things onto the table. I think at least uh, Miguel is definitely the, the right word. Um, maybe to, to complete what you said, I, I think, um, you know, as you pointed out, Alberto, these are innovation projects. We don't have uh, all the answers. There are uh, definitely innovations, both uh, from a, a business standpoint. Um, so if you take healthcare, you know, how would we change healthcare? Um, and, and at the same time, there are still infrastructure questions related to, for instance, how we want to manage uh, distributed storage with all these edge nodes um, and transfer state of the applications. 
Um, so innovation has to happen at different level. And one of our role is also to ensure that we leverage you know, the innovation across those different scope, across those different actors, uh, to ensure that we uh, leverage this technology foundation that we will have with edge computing to the best of uh, its capabilities. Um, and I think that because you know our companies have both uh, you know um, the uh, consulting capabilities, but as well the technical expertise, uh, we're in a, a very uh, good place to facilitate uh, this exchange of innovation uh, across the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, makes, makes sense. Um, there is there is still um, uh, there is another kind of implicit challenge in in, in, in those pan European projects, which is I, I, I think the, um, the the concept of collaboration among competitors, right? So I mean, all these projects, I mean, your companies are involved in, in a number of, of, of these uh, pan European innovation initiatives. They all require. Um, some degree of, of cooperation and collaboration between between uh, different actors in the market, but specifically for in your case, it, it's, it implies collaboration among companies that are actually competing in the market as well, and that that links with that concept of um, that Klaus mentioned the, this concept of, uh, of of a European open source ecosystem. So, so how do you see that? How do you see your companies um, collaborating together in building a, a, a technology or a core? number of core technologies that will be applied in the market in different business models. How do you see that? You see that's a smooth transition internally or is that going to come with some some reluctancy? That's <laughs> not going to be easy questions. <laughs> no, 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 it's not, a, it's not a, an easy question. I think that there is an exercise in, in our companies because almost all of us have a, a, a wide portfolio of solutions and services and now we are in a world where the, the business is, is, is wider and, and is more global. So you compete with more people. So you need to identify which areas of real excellence you have. So maybe you should concentrate as a company in those areas where you are really different, where you have really something really special. And you need to, to close those areas that where you are not really the best. And to just to complement your your offering and your services, you need to to collaborate with others, with others that are excellent in those areas where you are not. So this is an, a natural evolution of concentrating in less areas, but uh, more, with more power. Also from the people point of view, from the investment point of view, from the commercial focus point of view, from, from many things, and complement with others. So if you, you follow this, uh, this approach, I think that then we, we compete, but um, not, not so much. And, and so we, it's more important that we collaborate to complement that uh, and because, yeah, this is, um, but this is a, a huge cultural change. And there is also, um, uh, a pain of cutting part of your company where there are people, there are investments, there are many things. So it's not so easy to cut those legs, but it's a will be actually required, in my opinion. I'm surprised that you say cut, uh, Miguel, because um, um, I, I, I have... Very graphical. Very gra I don't... Yeah. <laughs> I think, Somehow, yeah. I, 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 I think it's kind of kind of the opposite. Huh? I mean, if we if we isolate, if we're all working in silos, huh? may that be in different countries or may that be company A versus company B, uh, we art, we actually artificially shrink the market. Uh, the the use cases like autonomous driving, you can't you can't think about autonomous driving. And you stop at a French border, French German border, or you stop uh, autonomous driving because you're moving from BMW country to Renault country. Uh, the, the, some markets exist um, if you um, agree and uh, standardize, cooperate on certain standards. This is, for instance, how a shipment container industry started. Mm -hmm. And um, cooperation will actually open up a much, much, much bigger opportunity where we can focus on the real value that we bring 
uh, towards the customers and the use cases um, um, because uh, like, I, like I always try to say, a, a supply chain doesn't stop at any kind of border, doesn't stop um, because supplier A is using uh, Indra, supplier B is using CUP, and supplier C is using ATOS. It doesn't stop a supply chain. Uh, the use cases we're talking about, um, uh, we, we, we can provide value for our customers. We can provide opportunities for our companies if you want. If we look at the big picture, how you realize um, use cases across, we mentioned this before, IT, OT, mobile providers, and by the way, also the hyperscalers. This is nothing uh, that's that's positioned against the hyperscalers. And um, it, it is a challenge, as Miguel said, because it requires a little bit of rethinking. But the opportunity, as, you, as I said, it's not a, for me. It's not a cut. Uh, it's opening up uh, really new opportunities for our customers, but also for us as companies because the market is is growing and not uh, cutting. And to build uh, on on what Klaus just uh, just mentioned, I do think that uh, standardization and adoption of those standards. Uh, we'll go, you know, through the open source community to ensure that interoperability across organization. Um, for instance, uh, we co-chair the GSMA OPG group, which defines, you know, uh, at a very high level, the boundaries of uh, an edge, uh, uh, an edge platform. Um, but really, for it to become real. Um, we we need you know the, the code to be shared and to be continuously improved, um, and that's why uh, at the latest uh, Mobile World Congress, the project Tamara with the Linux Foundation was created, so that um, this project, which focuses especially on uh, federation and how we deploy application on uh, edge nodes, uh, is not just a piece of paper, but uh, becomes really you know an open source. Uh, code that uh, anyone can reuse and implement to ensure that at some point, of course, it will take some time, uh, but um, uh, ensure that interoperability. And I think, again, that's uh, that's key uh, because we're in a connected world, like Klaus mentioned, to realize the use case now. Um, it's an ecosystem, um, definitely, but also for uh, sustainability. Again, to ensure that we don't redeploy platforms because there's some kind of locking to a specific set of API um, that uh, that has to be used. So for me, that's uh, really one one aspect: the standardization and adoption that I, I do see from the open source community. Yep, you know, it's um, it, it's it's really interesting, and then the I think I think. Also through this this innovation projects, but also from the I mean speaking from the open source kind of community or the European open source community, we I think we we all have um, oh there are high, very high hopes on the on the role that um, the companies that, like yours can can actually play in um, bringing all your the, I mean, the expertise, the capabilities, and the experience you have, and um, also in terms of sustainability of some of the some of some of the smaller um, open source projects out there and the integration with uh, with larger solutions or bringing them to, to market. Um, I also like this concept that um, well, like I, I, <laughs> I understand the concept that the, that the, uh, Miguel Angel mentioned the this this cultural this cultural change because and and I think something for, probably that we have to explore uh, in the near future how to. How to collaborate together, and that's also something we're happy to contribute to um, from the open source community, uh, contributing to help. I mean, industry actors in in, in Europe who, who are more uh, familiar with with the idea of consuming technology, open source technology, than actually maintaining or building that technology. So, I, I, and I, I guess we'll we'll have to collaborate with uh, with companies like yours as well to to. To bring that cultural change and facilitate that cultural change also to to industry to the to the European industry as a whole, just to make them more more active in in, in taking an, a, 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 a role in maintaining or developing the technology that they use. That sometimes their business is depending on. So I think that's, that's going to be a collective uh, challenge for all of us. Very good. I'm glad to see that you you see the potential in there. 
Well, um, that was that was a really interesting, <laughs> a really interesting panel. I think the um, we, we I think probably the um, the um, we'll, we'll have to follow up at some point, uh, preferably in person <laughs> in the near future. Um, well, uh, that, that was all from from our side. I think I think we we discussed really really interesting topics here and uh, open it's an open discussion for for a lot of the, the stuff we mentioned um, during the during the panel. Um, I would like just to thank you all again for for, for joining for joining us at the at the Open Nebula Con twenty twenty two. With that's the it's the ninth edition. We, we have been celebrating it for a couple of years with, due to the pandemic. So. It was about time. So, well, thank you, thank you all very much for for joining us. Thank you, uh, Philippe, thank you, Klaus, Miguel Angel. Thank you, Alberto. We'll see you around in the different initiatives in which we are also involved. And absolutely, the next all celebration party. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. Hopefully. Yep. <laughs> Klaus, I have a very specific question for you. Very technical uh, question, Klaus. Uh, how can you have a, a TIE fighter and uh, it's not the USS Enterprise in the background so close to each other? I don't know if we, if we have time, huh? but uh, it's actually something I use to explain the difference uh, between federated uh, ecosystems like IAX. Uh, you know that uh, uh, the Star Trek universe is that of a very utopian and friendly federation of uh, uh, um, uh, planets. Uh, whilst, um, mm -hmm. you know, this is the evil and the dark forces of a very centralized, uh, big um, dystopian view. Huh? So this is a little <laughs> boy, how I try to explain uh, Gaia X um, um, in, in um, yeah, how is it called? In, well, with Star Wars and Star Trek. Okay. It it works. The puts you in between, right? The, are you in the Rebel Alliance or? Or in between the next, you, you see, I also have the Elk, but <laughs> the, the next, thing, next thing I'm going to put up is actually Buzz Lightyear. If you know Buzz from, from, from uh, Toy Story uh, with, I don't know if you know it, but his uh, slogan is to infinity and beyond, uh, because this is, this needs to be our ambition to get the edge thingy up Whoa. and running. <laughs> and will. Well, well there, there are actually some companies, as you know, launching this uh, small note, edge notes on satellites. So I think that's a good step. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, thank you all again. And, thank you. Um, see thank you all you. around. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.